Welcome to the Fish Casting Podcast. I am Tanner of Fish Facts TV on YouTube. Hey guys, and I'm Captain Tim. You can find me uh, on Instagram at Captain Strip. All right, guys, we got a lot of stuff to pack in today. Um, first, I just want to do some quick introductions. Again, thank you everyone for listening. We had 75 podcast streams um, and 60 views on YouTube. We were also able to pretty easily get into um, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So those are the two main podcast um, platforms. So you can go to listen to um, there. But uh, other than that, we'll uh, just wanted to mention that and we'll get into the meat and potatoes. Tim, can you tell me, uh, did you get to do any fishing this weekend? Well, this weekend was a little strange. Uh, after a really good weekend last weekend, uh, we decided to, to kind of mix it up and relax. Um, I was able to take uh, my loving wife, uh, my chocolate lab, and some coworkers out to a local sandbar called Outback Key. Uh, those who are from the West Florida probably are familiar with Fort DeSoto. Outback Key is kind of an extension of, of the Fort DeSoto North Beach. It's a great little unincorporated sandbar that dogs can kind of run around uh, off leash. There's great snook fishing out there. And it's just always a really great time. There's good people and just a lot of people out there enjoying the Florida sunshine. Uh, we had a great day. Uh, we decided to do that just because uh, this weekend was the St. Petersburg Open. Uh, it's the world's largest spear fishing tournament as it's a claim to be. Uh, Tanner, have you ever heard about the St. Pete Open before? I'm not familiar. I, I really don't know a ton about spearfishing. So please tell me more. Well, St. Pete Open, it, it's a really cool tournament. Um, people come from front and wide to participate in it. You know, the, the West Coast of Florida has some excellent spearfishing. Um, it, it's one of these tournaments where there's a lot of big players from local uh, spearing enthusiasts all the way up to people, like I said, that come from around the world to spear this tournament. So you know, there's hundreds of boats out there, people going all around from up to the middle grounds down to uh, the Keys for this tournament. And as long as you're back to the dock and in the way line by a certain time, you can go as far as you like. There's even been rumors of people getting on a helicopter and going to the Bahamas to shoot a fish and now, fly back. Is this, so it, it, is this a scuba so it, or is it only free diving? So there's a bunch of different divisions. Uh, there's a scuba division and there's a diving division. There's all sorts of different fish you can harvest from pelagics to sheep's head to black grouper to the rest of the groupers. Um, it's a really cool tournament um, and anyone has a chance. I mentioned people getting on these helicopters and flying around and shooting fish in, in exotic locations, but there's people that shoot a sheep's head in their backyard that ends up winning them the sheep's head division and there are some awesome prizes. Uh, this year, I didn't do it. Uh, just a little too busy with going on with work. I didn't, I didn't plan well, so I missed the captain's meeting, forgot to register. So the wife and I decided we'd lay low and, and have a relaxing day on the beach. Did a little bit of snook fishing, but there was just too much boat traffic and too many people around. So I uh, wasn't real productive there. So I just dedicated my time to hanging out with the family and, and spending some time with my dog and running around on the beach. Now, are you a big spear fisherman? I, I feel like I've talked to you a lot about uh, conventional fishing in the past, but I, I had no idea you were a spear fisherman. So I'm 99% I'm hook and line. Um, I try to get out and, and spear fish maybe two or three times a year. So I'm definitely not um, you know, super competitive. It's just a great event put on by some, some really good people and the prizes are always awesome. You really just kind of meet a bunch of other uh, interested spiros and and divers, so it's a great networking event. If uh, if you're into meeting friends and and trying to to expand, you know who you know and and get other get around other people that love the water, and just love being under the water. So to answer your question, not a huge spear fisherman. I have a couple spear guns. Um, I I am a, a master scuba diver, but uh, I find myself if I'm going to dedicate the time to run offshore. I'm a hook and line guy first, and spearfishing comes a, a far away second for me. Yeah, absolutely. I, I've i tried to go spearfishing twice. Um, I lived in American Samoa for a little while, so out there 
Um, I did a lot of fishing, but a lot of friends of mine uh, did some spear fishing. And the one time I went, uh, my friend actually shot a snapper and the spear went straight into the reef and it was a whole debacle. So uh, I'll, I'll save that story for another day. But my one spear fishing uh, story wasn't the greatest experience. Yeah, I, I used to be in better shape and I used to do a lot of uh, free diving and I spent some time in the Bahamas and in the Caribbean where uh, free diving with pole spears and Hawaiian slings is uh, uh, the way to go. Um, ever since then, I, my passion for it has died out since I did more scuba. It's, I feel like it's cheating, although it, it still is very difficult. Don't, don't let me uh, tell you that, it, that it's not difficult to, to get a fish in your own environment depending on the fish species. But uh, I, I don't do it a whole lot. Um, I, I enjoy just getting down underwater and, and seeing the fish more than shooting them. I'll, I'll save them for hook and line uh, any day. Yeah, um, I, I do a lot of snorkeling, but never I've never been scuba, scuba certified. I've never tried to go down there and shoot anything. Well, you went um, uh, snorkeling this week, right? Actually, I did. Um, you know, like I said, we took the boat out. With the boat club, I get the boat about once a week. So this coming week, I have it on Friday, and we're recording on a Tuesday. And last week, I had it on Wednesday, and we recorded on a Thursday. So this is a gap where, you know, I'm not going to have the boat. Um, so the I've always heard a lot about John Pennycamp State Park in Key Largo. We were looking for something to do that weekend, and my wife loves snorkeling. So we decided to make the trip down for the day. It's about an hour and 10 minute drive from Miami. And we just did their basic snorkeling trip. We did the 930, which I think was pretty good. Um, and we went out there and it was, it was beautiful. The water was crystal clear. It was really shallow. We went in about eight feet deep. The way it was laid out there was large coral heads just kind of in the middle of a grass flat. So I've seen a lot of coral reefs that are your more traditional reefs. But this was literally just a grass flat covered in coral head. So it was, it was a really unique type of uh, environment or ecosystem that I hadn't experienced before. Um, so I really enjoyed going out and seeing that. And I got to see some great fish too. You know, my wife is always excited about seeing the parrot fish and the angel fish. But for me, I'm always looking at the fish I could catch. And we saw some really nice snappers. There's a ton of yellowtails a few mangroves, quite a few schoolmasters. I saw one or two nice muttons, and I actually saw a nice dog snapper, which is something that I really had never even seen until about a year ago. I think I'd caught one, but they're pretty common here in Southeast Florida. I've gotten a lot in Miami, and you know this was a pretty good one we saw down there. I definitely would recommend, now the rest of the state park outside of the snorkeling trip, didn't really it was kind of a bay like mangrove so people were like sitting at the beach but the water was not like sounds like your sandbar that like clear green bay water it was more of like a brown backwater brackish when you're inside the mangroves because the boat took us a couple miles offshore so we weren't um back in the mangroves like that yeah, I've, I've spent a little bit of time down there uh, running some boats. I got to tell you, uh, when you're on a, a quick center console, going out through some of those mangrove lined uh, skinny canals out to the uh, uh, Atlantic, it can be a pretty fun ride. It makes you appreciate going around some of those turns at a high rate of speed. But uh, you got to be careful there. They got Crash Corner there, and it's, it's named that for a reason. <laughs> oh, yeah. I was so I went and stood in the bow when we were coming in there. And man, I don't know, there was two boats flying, you know, both up on plane, cutting through those. Those are really narrow canals. And we were coming back, it was dead low tide. You know, a foot off of our uh, starboard side, there was uh, basically, you know, six inches of water. And this big, there, I bet, I guess their glass bottom and snorkel tour boats was cruising at probably close to 20 knots, maybe even 21, 22. And then you had a center console come in the other direction, going just as fast, if not faster. Yeah, it, uh, <laughs> it makes you appreciate those operators because it, it's remarkable how they can whip those things through multiple times a day. And then you add all the recreational boaters and you just don't know what they're doing. So 
Yeah, it, it can be dicey, but uh, I'll tell you what, it's also a whole lot of fun when you go screaming through there. Oh, yeah, I, I bet it is. But um, actually, so today, after not getting to fish this weekend, I did, I've been scouting a lot because I'm trying to find more uh, spots offshore in Miami. So on the way back from the Keys, we didn't do any fishing, but we did some scouting. So I'm looking for new spots from the shore, little bridges. Um, if you look at that card, have you ever taken card sound up from the Keys? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Card, card Sound Road, uh, one of my favorite uh, haunts there. Um, Alabama Jacks is, is on the uh, west side. It's uh, kind of in the middle of nowhere back in the mangrove uh, uh, dive bar. But uh, that, that also is for another day. We can talk about that. Yeah, Alabama Jacks is definitely on my list. Um, it's in between like Card Sound, kind of when you go into the mangroves, leaving North um, Key Largo and Alabama Jacks. And there's a bunch of areas where you can just pull off the side of the road there, little bridges kind of feeding into Biscayne Bay. So those are the areas I think one of these weeks I want to go down there and just try to catch some snapper, some snook. Um, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if there was permitted bonefish out there because it's going into the, the south end of Biscayne Bay and they catch, they catch a lot of permanent bonefish down there. Yeah, always something good to try. Um, I reckon that would be a lot of fun. But uh, speaking of scouting out spots, so um, today I didn't have to work, so I decided I was going to try the Government Cut Jetty um, off South Beach. So it's a beautiful place. I've been out there. I've been to the beach before. Um, I heard there's snook and tarpon out there. So I tried to get up early this morning, and things just didn't work out. Woke up at 6 by the time I parked and got bathed, it was like 7.30, which is the sun rose at 6.50. So really not, you know, for snook and those big snapper, you want to be there before uh, the sun rises if you're going to go in the morning. So I caught a few snapper, but it wasn't, the, I think the water was too clear. There were so many chubs and so many grunts that you know, I couldn't even get the bait to the snapper. I, I talked to a guy that fishes out there more regularly, and he said there's a lot of snook at night there by the lights. So that's definitely something I want to try. But I think until the mullets start getting a little thicker, I'm not going to spend my time trying to fish South Beach anymore. Actually, uh, we were talking about spearfishing earlier. I ran into some guys that were spearfishing. So after I gave up on fishing, I decided I was going to hop in the water, kind of like you said last week, where you like to scout out some fishing spots. I was like, all right, you know, this bite was pretty slow. I'm going to, I had the flippers and the snorkel in the car. I'm going to hop down there and check it out, see how it looks. Tons of tiny grunts, tiny lane snappers. But overall, other than barracudas, um, there weren't a lot of fish you could catch, at least within the part of the jetty that you could walk to. But I did run into some uh, Fish Facts TV uh, YouTube viewers that I started talking to and recognized me from the, the YouTube channel. Um, and they pulled in a nice barracuda. But they said to get those snapper, hogs, and lionfish, you got to swim out to the very end of the jetty. And I was by myself, and I just didn't really feel safe um, going that far out without kind of having a spot or at least another person to keep me accountable. Well, that's really cool that you saw some fans out there, and, and equally as cool that they were uh, welcoming and shared some of their local intel and their knowledge about where they're seeing those fish that, you know, the targeted species. So that gives you a good idea, you know, for the future of where to go. So, you know, I, I, think, I think you turned it into a successful trip. Uh, you know, you said you didn't get a whole lot, but you can go out there and use that and, and hopefully be successful. So that sounds successful to me. Yeah, it was a good learning experience, and hopefully I'll be able to apply it um, going forward. Uh, before we go and talk about the fish of the week, uh, what fishing do you have any planned coming up? Do you have any uh, upcoming trips? So that's what I don't know. Uh, right before this, I was watching the news. There seems like there's a couple tropical systems kind of cruising uh, west for, off Africa. So. Uh, um, the local weathercaster, he said that he didn't know what, what the weekend looks like as far as when and when. So I'm not sure. Uh, um, I'm definitely anxious to get offshore. Um, after this last week, being at the sandbar, had a great time. 
Um, caught a lot of bait, didn't catch a lot of uh, uh, snook or anything else, but I'm really excited to get back out there offshore. Um, if, if it's going to be rainy and windy, I, I might, I might stick inside the bay. Um, I got, I got a couple clients that I'm supposed to take out later on, uh, this month. So I might do some inshore, um, target fishing, looking for those snooks, reds, trout. They're all closed currently, um, from the red tide of 2018, but there's still obviously a lot of fun to catch and I need to get those fish patterned. So when I go inshore in a couple of weeks, I at least know where they're at. How about now you? Do you have anything coming up? Uh, yeah, I actually on Friday, uh, I have the boat club boat. Uh, I got a friend of mine, it's his birthday. So I'm going to get him out there. Um, my plan is we're going to go to about 220. There's a bunch of public numbers in 220, similar to where I caught the Almaco Jack last week. But last week I fished one spot, one specific wreck. So what I want to do this week is drift the entire area so there's basically a line of wrecks in the like 210 220 range so i think what i'm going to do is i'm going to get a chicken rig with a 16 ouncer drop it and just drift that entire area and then after that we're going to do one to two drifts depending on how we do obviously if we don't do well we're not going to hang around there um i found another one that's in like 80 so we're going to try to anchor up on the wreck in 80 drop down the chum bag and see if we can't pull out some uh, muttons and yellowtails. I, I really, really want to get some big muttons and that's something that I'm still pretty weak on. That's kind of been uh, bugging me. It's something that I, I want to get figured out. No, sounds like a good plan to me. I'm, I'm anxious to see how it uh, turns out. Uh, I know we'll be talking about it next week here. Um, I'm jealous of the muttons uh, that you have down at the fishery. Uh, we just don't get them uh, off of St. Pete unless you go way out. Um, you sometimes find them in the middle grounds up north, but they're, they're more southerly for us. So I've actually never caught a, a keeper mutton uh, anywhere near Tampa Bay. So definitely jealous. They're, they're a great fish and, and definitely awesome to eat. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's too bad that we can't keep reds anymore. But again, that's probably another, uh, another argument for another day. <laughs> That's a uh, very hot debated topic right there. All right, Tim, next thing we got is the fish of the week. Today's fish of the week is the Gulf flounder. Hold on, let me get the Latin name of that sucker real quick. It is para, Paralycus albigatata. You want to be yes. really fancy. Uh, do you that know anything sounds about, right. Do you know anything about gulf flounder? Yeah, I know a little bit. Uh, I know how to catch them decently. Uh, it's not a fish that I consistently target. But uh, I got a few spots and a couple tricks that I'd you know, be happy to share about where I would go and target flounder. Um, locally here uh, in the mouth of Tampa Bay, there's um, another sandbar. I know I was already talking about sandbars. But it's, there's a key called Egmont Key. And uh, it's very deep on the north tip of it, and it, and it rises very quick up to a sandy key. Um, I've found great success fishing for flounder there, um, just with a jig head and white bait, just dragging it along the bottom up that slope, uh, either from the beach or casting it up to the beach off a boat and dragging it down. The flounder just weighed on that, uh, like a 45 degree angle slope and uh, they ambush prey as they go by. So I found that's a, a really good spot to catch them. I've also had uh, really good um, success out on some of the, the local artificial reefs. I generally don't fish there that often, but with light tackle fishing near the reef structure, uh, I find that the flounder in, in the spring and summer can be very plentiful. Um, it's actually kind of a nice surprise when you may be out there um, fishing light tackle for snapper. And then the flounder uh, just in the sand off the reef kind of come and grab your bait. It's, it's always a surprise when you get them. We, I generally find that those are bigger flounder. They're bigger fish, the ones offshore. So um, like I said, I don't, I don't target fish for flounder very often. Um, but, but if I was going to, I would definitely try, you know, any of these um, deep water, fast moving um, beach sandbars. Um, I've had great success there. Uh, do, do you know much about them, Tanner? Um, quick question for you before I tell you what I know about them. Uh, what is the depth on those reefs where you're getting them? 
uh, the offshore artificial reefs? So where I've had the best luck offshore for them uh, is about seven to nine miles out. So you're, you're looking here, that's anywhere between 30 to 35 feet deep. Um, so not very deep. But uh, if you run light tackle, like I said, either on jig heads, uh, snapper fishing, or you know, uh, light knocker rigs or fish finder rigs um, with the live bait, kind of dragging across the bottom or, or getting it down there, sometimes a flounder, they just surprise you and ambush your bait and, and you get a, a, a nice tasty fish. Sounds awesome. So what I know about a gulf flounder is the way you can tell a Gulf flounder from an Atlantic flounder is they have three large spots on them, not an Atlantic flounder, a Southern flounder. So Southern flounder, which is the species in the same genus that lives in the Southern half of the East Coast, live in the Gulf as well. And you can also get Gulf flounder in the Southern Atlantic, but they're just not as plentiful. But if you see those three spots, that's how you know, okay, and like flounder are covered in spots, but it's three pronounced spots with like large white rings. Like if you look at a gulf flounder and an Atlantic or a, a southern flounder side by side, it's easy to tell the difference. Um, I've not caught a ton of gulf flounder. I caught one in Tampa Bay with my uncle, I think when I was in high school, and I caught a, quite a few of them in Tallahassee, not Tallahassee, but um, what is it? Or Marks, St. Marks, St. Marks. I don't know, I took you to that spot one time back in college, way back um, in the trails, there's like a spillway back there. And I used to get quite a few gulf flounder back in that little hole. Yeah, I, I remember going there. Uh, did I ever take you to the spot where the, the guy ran us off for catching his, catching his pet redfish? Was that you I, think, I was with? I think we did go there one time. <laughs> That was the last time we went there, I'm pretty sure. But I, I can imagine you catching some nice flounder up there on the spillway. That was always a productive area for you. Yeah, yeah. Up, up there in Tallahassee, it's, in a lot of ways, it's more like the fishing in Jacksonville than the fishing you see in St. Pete and the fishing you see down in Miami. All right. Well, um, last week we asked you guys to send us questions. So we have two questions and we're just kind of going to debate uh, those two questions and between the two of us and give our thoughts. Uh, the first question was submitted on Instagram by Connor Kelly one and he said should Goliath grouper regulations be lifted for commercial slash recreational? I'll hand that one to you first Tim. Yeah thanks. Uh, <laughs> that's another uh, um Fiercely debated topic. Um, like we mentioned in the last episode and, and this one, uh, I am a diver. Um, I see a lot of these fish. Um, they are overrun on our local ledges, shipwrecks, artificial reefs. Um, I've personally lost a number of good fish that I've been battling hook and line to these goliaths. They are everywhere. I think what's happened since the uh, 1990 shutdown of all harvest of these animals has been great. They've come back, they're booming. Um, I think that it maybe should be a tag system for a very limited number of tags to go out annually. And I'm talking 50, 75, 100, not many at all. And they could be either recreation, uh, recreational or commercial. But uh, I, I think we need to do something. They, they are an apex predator. They eat anything that, that is slower than them and they ambush prey constantly. Uh, they're, they're a big vacuum cleaner that's under the water and they're sucking everything up. Um, so unless we can teach them to eat more lionfish, I'm all for uh, a small harvest to start and see where it goes. What about you? So I, I was hoping to have a disagreement with you on that topic so we could get into a heated debate. But to be honest, that's exactly what I think the solution is to a very small, limited, um, I think that there should be a preference toward recreational and maybe there could be some sort of exchange, you know, give more pounds to red snapper to the recreational anglers, because I think that if you let um, recreational anglers catch Goliath grouper, it's just hard to find a place to do, um, to properly distribute that much meat, you know, especially if we're only going to give out 
75 to 100 tags per year and obviously closely monitor that if the if the populations do start to decline after several years of that that's something that needs to be monitored every year uh, but i think that in the commercial setting it's something that can be more um properly used and properly you know make sure everyone gets to eat them because i think if a recreational fisherman catches a three four hundred pound fish some of that fish is going to end up going to waste whereas if you give it to a commercial fisherman that's a payday you know and people will probably like to eat it i mean it is grouper oh absolutely uh, um I've never had it, obviously. Um, I'm not old enough to, to have had it. You know, I had a two year window there, but I've, I've, I've never had it. Um, and the, the thing is, is a lot of these agencies that, that put out these mandates on the fisheries, they don't know whether, what these animals are eating since they haven't been harvested in 30 years. So they just don't know how many of the fish and, and crustaceans and things down there that these uh, Goliath group are eating. So. I think it needs to be done. Maybe even um, if if the data is given to scientists from the from the tagging system, I don't know. I, there's people much smarter than me that hopefully will come up with something. But I, I definitely think something needs to happen. Now, have you ever caught a Goliath grouper? Oh, absolutely. Um, I've caught small ones. I've caught hooked, mostly big ones, um, but they are very strong. Uh, like any grouper, you just you just got to keep on them and you just got to keep battling them in. Um, there are a number of small ones throughout the, the bridges and passes around Tampa Bay. And when I say small, you know, I'm talking 20 to 50 pounds. Uh, so they're still a big fish and they are still a ton of fun to catch. So they're, they are very prolific in this area. Um, I think we could benefit from a small tagged uh, um, quota. Now, going back to the tagged quota, what would be the size limit for those tagged fish? Obviously, we wouldn't want them, people using their tags. I don't think anybody would, but, you know, on a six, seven, eight pound Goliath grouper. Yeah, I think that one's tough. Um, I'm not sure. I know in, in Alaska for halibut, uh, you can keep two halibut no matter the size um, per day. That's how they regulate it. Um, but a lot of times that's because those fish are, are uh, in bad shape by the time they get pulled up from however many hundred feet. So I don't, I don't know what that looks like. Um, you know, I, I could do a little bit more research on it, think on it some more. But, uh, you know, it, it's definitely something to, to think about. Um, you would think that if you only get such a limited number of tags that people would be going after those giants. Absolutely. All right, so our next question was submitted by AJ Devs on Instagram. And he says, if you could only fish within a thousand square miles for the rest of your life, where would it be? Um, so I'll, I'll start out with this one uh, first, since you took first cut on the last one. Uh, I have fished quite a few different places. You know, I lived in New Orleans, I lived in New York City. Um, I lived in American Samoa. I have gotten to fish regularly, you know, because it's one thing to go on a fishing vacation, like fishing in the Keys when I was a kid was fun. But when you live somewhere, you know, you get familiar, you get to see it. And ah, fishing in American Samoa was really cool. My face is like getting absorbed. I don't know if you, whoever's watching the video, the I have a background and the background is like slowly eating away at my face. I don't know why. Let me try and maybe turn the light on. Not that many people watch it on video. So I guess uh, you guys will never know if you're listening to on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. But anyways, fishing in American Samoa was really awesome. Um, the problem with fishing in American Samoa is there's not a lot within a thousand miles. You know, you have maybe 20 islands um, and you, we got some really big dolphins, really nice tuna, but that inshore fishing is just non-existent. Um, I hate to say Florida because that's where I've lived most of my life. Um, Louisiana is another, another like New Orleans, just say if you drew your line in New Orleans, I've never fished north of New Orleans, like Mississippi, Arkansas, Texas um, inland, but I've heard there's a lot of good striper fishing around there. Of course, in Venice, New Orleans area, you have world-class inshore fishing. The redfish and the trout there 
are like nothing I have ever experienced in my life. We went out with my dad one day, and we probably caught 50, 60 redfish on dead shrimp without even moving the boat once. And that was in like a three hour charter. So if you know how to find them, and then you go offshore and the bottom fishing is so easy. You know, I'm in Miami watching my bottom machine, looking for the right structure of these sunken reefs. When you go out, uh, my friends lived in Biloxi, so sometimes we'd go out of Venice, sometimes we'd go out of Biloxi. You drive out until you see a giant oil rig. And you're like, all right, we'll try that one. So I do think that I would pick Florida just because Florida, like the a thousand mile range drawn from Orlando, um, because there's just something about fishing Florida, but I would say Louisiana would be a very close second because there's some really awesome, if you have the funds to have a big offshore boat um, and you don't mind driving 70, 80 miles out to the oil rigs, or you have a flats boat, you know, it's kind of an either or situation, but I, I do think that that would be a very close second. No, that makes sense to me. Uh, you know, I, from what I understand about Louisiana too, I mean, just the, the yellowfin tuna population uh, there is just, it's just something that, to marvel at. I know a lot of people that run out and just crush the, the big giant yellowfin tunas in the right time of year. Um, as far as where I'd be, I, I think we're going to agree on this one too. You know, uh, um, I'm a sixth generation uh, Florida native. Uh, I grew up here. I've been fishing here all my life. Um, it's, it's a place I love. And in order to, to say, you know, if we're going to have to pick a spot within a thousand square miles, you, you're going to want to live there. Right. And, and although I'd love to live in the Seychelles or, or on Ascension Island in the middle of the <laughs> Atlantic and, and, and catch some crazy fish, um, it's just not practical. You know, if the question was, if you could, you know, fly anywhere at any point in time and fish, you know, I might. I might change my uh, uh, my answer, but I would definitely say Florida. The, the diversity of fishing is awesome. There's great bottom fishing. There's great inshore fishing. Uh, you can jet down to the Keys and just have you know tremendous beauty down there. Uh, it, it really has it all. It it is a sportsman's paradise. I love uh, being a Florida native and growing up in the Tampa Bay area. I discover things every time I go out that are new to me and are just a thing of beauty. I, I love it here, and, and this, this is a great place to be a fisherman. Yeah, absolutely. Maybe, maybe next week, um, again, submit those questions. I'll do, I did an Instagram question, so um, submit those to me, Instagram, or fishfactsdaily at gmail.com, fishfactstv on Instagram, fishfactstv on Facebook. Um, submit those questions to me in any way. These two questions were great. Um, both of those guys are actually friends of mine. So even if you don't know me, you know, don't, don't be afraid. Uh, just submit us a question and we'll, maybe we can find something that we disagree on because I feel sure uh, there's something out there. Oh, I guarantee we'll find something. We just need some support and some, uh, uh, some of our listeners to write something in. All right, guys. Well, uh, Tim, you have anything before we close it down? No, uh, uh, get out there and get fishing. Uh, you know, I can't stress it enough. If you live in a great spot and, and you're able to go, uh, make the best of it. You know, I, I wish every day I was fishing. I do have a, a, a normal job Monday through Friday, and all I can think about is getting on the water on the weekends. Um, check me out on Instagram. It's at Captain Strip. And I look forward to, uh, to seeing some of you guys' comments. Thank you for listening and watching. Absolutely. Uh, thanks everybody for tuning in. And we're recording this on a Tuesday and we're going to try to make it a weekly thing on Tuesdays going forward. So expect that to be released probably late Tuesday evening, um, early Tuesday morning. The fish casting with Captain Tim and Fish Facts TV on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and uh, make sure to subscribe and give us a five-star review. Thanks everybody.